Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 13, 2017. This is the week in charts. As usual, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. And for those of you who are watching recordings, thank you too. All right, what are we talk about? Well, a little bit of follow-up this week. Uh, first of all, is it the uh, is it the end of the world? We've been talking about a new bull leg here since uh, last what October, November, November. And now it seems like the bears are coming out of the woodwork. I'm going to talk a lot about that in a few minutes. Your questions on trading, obviously. Your favorite stock picks, uh, if you don't mind, hold off until we get to the charts so your stock pick does not get buried. Uh, what else? Ask about one stock at a time and then hit return. And that's for your benefit. You can ask about as many as you want. And I promise to try to get to as many as possible. And hopefully we won't, uh, we'll be able to get to the charts a little quicker today. I want to follow up just very briefly on IPOs, and we've been following, obviously, uh, Snapchat lately. Uh, once again, the ongoing following up on the methodology, which is the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever do, and that'll make more sense. Okay, this week's focus is going to be why trading is so hard, which we were talking about last week, and that's trend trading. And then I got the thing this morning, or... Or is it? I guess before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. I could sum it up quickly. All predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can have between now and then. So let's follow up on this Snapchat thing. If you go back a few weeks in my columns and in the week of charts, I woke up one day right around the time Snapchat came public. And I said, you know what? I do have some simple ways to trade IPOs that will stop you from buying them if they just come public and implode. But what if I came up with something that was a new system or a new method that would kind of illustrate my point? And a lot of my research and publications come from that type of thinking. And I'll give you an example. This, this pattern involves daylight, which means that the lows or our greater than the moving average. And that came from an article I wrote in 96, I think, in Stocks and Commodities magazine. And back then, I was just trying to prove that a simple system could work, a simple trend following system could work in currencies. And I was using the Japanese yen versus the dollar as an example. So just real quick, there's a few caveats, but the basic system is the IPO has to, it's low, has to be greater than its five-day moving average, and that's going to keep you from trading the IPO until day six at least. And number two, the close has to be a new closing high. So you can see so far, and this was what I set out to prove, and so far it's been right, that in order to buy IPO, you want to buy them if they go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. So, so far, just following this simple little pattern, I guess you want to call it, or a simple system, would have kept you out of Snapchat. And so far, so good on that one. So don't get caught up in the hype as part of what the point I'm trying to make. And number two, sometimes it could be just as simple. Now, I know it's not always as simple, but sometimes it could be just as simple as, don't buy them unless they start going up or don't buy them unless they go up, okay? The reason I said start going up, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about a Ferrari, which is RACE. It went down for a long, long time, but when it started going up again and actually triggered this simple pattern, it had a pretty good run from there. All right, lately we've been talking about what happened when the portfolio was getting ready to go negative. And trust me, sometimes it goes negative. It's not always as good. Uh, guys, hold off on your stock picks just for, just until we get to the charts, and, and I promise we'll get to them, just so they don't get buried in um, in the other questions. So anyway, we've been following up on, on the methodology quite a bit, and what happened was we were on the cusp of going negative, but we didn't quite go negative, and the stocks in the portfolio haven't stopped out. And I hate to use the word yet, but they haven't stopped out yet. So my point was, and I showed this live, 
was, hey, let's just follow along and see what happens. Now, of course, it could have ended badly, but my point is to follow the plan longer term, even though sometimes following the plan will you'll end up making less money. So if you go back a few weeks, as I said, actually a few months now, back in February, boy, this year's flying by, huh? The open portfolio had an open profit of 501, and that's actually counting a closed swing trade in here. And go in and watch previous videos if you want a, a further explanation on how the tracking works in the spreadsheet and the money management, position management, which we'll touch upon in a minute anyway. And like Sakota once saying, you get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. So my point back then was stay tuned and ain't over. Well, fast forward to last night. And again, this date is off. This date needs to be over here. But back in February, again, we had a measly gain of 501, and then following up to last night, which is 413. So this should be what 27 up here. This should be 27. This is a mistake. 27. Okay. You can see that that number is significantly bigger than the 501 number. Now we've had some additions and deletions to the portfolio since. My point is not to track the portfolio every week, although we will occasionally show the portfolio, as you know, a live portfolio. But the point is to follow the plan. And I just want to follow through on these particular setups, which would be Kim, CCJ, Salt, because the ones in yellow are still open. So we're going to continue to follow up on these and then obviously add in this open, this uh, closed loss here in this closed loss here. I'm sorry. Close close gain up here. Okay. Anyway, that's the weekly follow up in that. So for now we get to say bye Felicia for yet another week, which is kind of cool. So again, the point is follow the plan. And in this case, so far so good. And hopefully, and I know I should use the word hope, but hopefully we're following up on this these few trades a year from now. And it'll make for a great case of sticking with the trend. And hopefully, there's that word again, but even if they do stop out, it'll still be much greater than that $500 gain. Now, last week I began a discussion on, uh, guys, can you hold off on, um, oh, okay, I see what you did. I I'm guessing somebody wants, had, had to go back to work. Okay, no problem. But uh, hold off on stock picks till we get to the uh, chart, okay? Hey, Frenchie. Uh, so last week I started talking about why trade trading is so hard. And back then I said, well, it's going to be part one of, geez, how many par parts? Because trade trading is hard. But by the way, as I said last week, the only way to ever profit on a trade is to capture a trend. And like Covell said, paraphrasing him, whether you know it or not, you're all all successful traders are doing this. Okay, so you're you're following a trade whether you know it or not. And as I often say, as I just said, again, all successful trades must capture a trend. So I got to thinking this morning, and this was based on a interview that I watched or a part of an interview I watched with uh, Tim Ferriss, and he said something that made a lot of sense. So this morning I was thinking, or is it? And what Tim Ferriss said was, what would it look like if it were easy? And that's been my reoccurring theme. I have this getting started a trading course, which I'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. Which get, It's getting closer and closer and closer. It's just taking me a while to get it launched. This has been two years in the progress, nearly two years. So it'll be two years by the time I'm done. And... A reoccurring theme in this is how do I simplify this for someone who doesn't know anything about trading? And then before I do it, as I'll talk about more later in the presentation, I'm jumping ahead, but what would I want to know 
20 something maybe 30 years ago to save me a lot of time and money and hassle and heartache and psychological issues and along those lines it's like well what would it look like if it were easy and then last week someone emailed me and I've been getting quite a few of these emails lately which has been dovetailing nicely in with the course in my theory of hey what, what would happen if I went back and talked to that younger punk version of me what would I say and they were saying things like you know now that I am honoring my stop now that I am not trading and mediocre conditions and looking at the market and said yep we chopped sideways here for three months maybe I should be selective and a list of these very basic behaviors that people soon forget about when they begin trading but coming back to those, and, and the cocktail napkin came up. So what would it look like if it were easy? And again, the cocktail napkin is the way I see system design. If you can't explain a methodology on a cocktail napkin, then I think you should toss it out. Now, there's a few little details to my system in addition to what's showed here, but... If you get this part, you're well on your way, okay? We're looking for a what? A trend and a pullback. That's pretty much it. Now, sometimes it could be an emerging trend and a little bit of a pullback, but that's kind of like 2.0. Now, getting back to the, is it really that hard? It's like, well, what do I preach? Persistency. What's persistency? Persistency is a stock's ability to go up day after day after day after day after day. So notice in this particular case, the stock is going up day after day after day after day after day after day. Okay? For the most part. And if you move this line around a little bit, you could probably get it to intersect nearly all of the lines in this trend. And obviously, it has moved higher because it was where? It was down here. And now it's up here. Now, you don't just blindly jump on a trend, although in some cases you can in an IPO. And then here's the thing, too. If you're going to fight if you're gonna fight the trend, you might as well jump on it because you'll do a hell of a lot better. So I, let me rephrase that. You would do a hell of a lot better just jumping in a trend midstream than fighting the trend. The only problem with jumping in midstream is that occasionally you will have something like a knockout move. So in this particular case, we had a TKO, what I call a trend knockout. And all we're looking for is a sharp move lower. That's it, against the prevailing trend. And in some cases, you could buy right above the high, put a stop right below the low. So if you get this chart, if you get this set up, I think you're well on the way. And that's one of the things that I talked about a couple of weeks ago because this course is just in my mind, morning, noon, night. When I wake up, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. <laughs> Not just when I wake up, but when I wake up in the middle of the night. And is it really that hard? And it's far from easy, but it's not nearly as hard as most try to make it. And if you just took this one pattern, persistency with a TKO, I think you could be successful. Why are more people successful? Well, I'm going to touch upon that towards the end. But for one thing is, you would have to sit on your hands a long time waiting for this pattern. Right now, you're not going to see very many of these, if any. Why? Because the market's going sideways. Well, one thing I was thinking about as I was getting ready to go live this morning is, one of the biggest things you could do to help your success is to figure out how to avoid losing trades. Now, that could be a holy grail hunt in and of itself. I've, I've programmed systems years ago, and when I got my first profitable one, I started thinking, well, geez, all I need to do now is figure out a way to eliminate all the losers. Well, you're not going to eliminate all the losers. But there are some simple things you could do to eliminate losers, some of them at least. 
for instance, rewind the tape once this thing is uh, posted to YouTube and look at that Snapchat chart, okay? Until it sets up as some sort of setup, there's nothing to do, okay? Waiting for entries will keep you out of a lot of trouble. I'll walk you through an example here in just one second. Sometimes with these TKO type of moves, you get your sharp sell off, you're ready to buy, and then what happens the next day? It opens down here and then implodes. Well, no capital was put in harm's way. And that's hugely important, and I don't want to go too far, digress too far to this, but as you know, by avoiding that trade, you not only avoided a 2% loss, you have avoided having to make back more than 2% on your account to recoup for that 2% loss. And by the way, if you're not following the system by waiting for that entry, then not only will you have that 2% loss because you didn't follow the system, well, you're unlikely to follow the money management, and that 2% loss will likely be a lot bigger. And then recovering from it, it's going to be a lot tougher. And then guess what? Now you're going to have more psychological issues. Now that you've broken the money management rules, and now that you've broken the methodology rules, you're going to have some psychological problems. Now, is it really that hard? Well, it's somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but on the back of my business card, I have uptrend, downtrend, and sideways. And if you want a business card, P.O. Box 298, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. I'll be happy to send you one. A-B-I-T-A -A, Springs. Louisiana, 70420. And tape one to your monitor. I'm literally, literally right here on my monitor right now. I'm looking at the back of my business card. So I don't ever try to outsmart the market. Again, it's not as hard as people make it. So... All right, Dave, you, you joke around a lot with the uptrend and downtrend arrows, the big blue arrows, which someone told me to stick up my rear once and then call me a trend following moron. <laughs> and that stuck. But take a look at a monthly S&P chart, okay? Go back throughout history and see if you could draw some arrows. Okay, well, there was an uptrend in the 90s, right? There was a bear market in 2000. There was a bull market in 2003. There was a bear market in 2008. I always say 2007 because we got a lot of sell signals early on in that one. They won't always be telegraphed that great, but that was kind of cool. And then obviously we've been in pretty much a bull market since 2009. Okay. Now that's a monthly chart. It's going to be a little slow to turn, a little tough to trade off of, but at least you know the general direction of the market. Now, if we take a look at a daily chart, then obviously, summers, which could be a pain in the ass, not all the time, but quite often, we were pretty much sideways throughout the summer, early fall, and we had a nice run after the election. And then we're kind of stuck in a sideways mode now, okay? So it's not completely hindsight. We knew we were in uptrend back in December. And now we know we're in a sideways trend in March or April. Okay? So, yeah, when you're following a trend, there's going to be some lag until you discover that that trend has changed. But that's okay. And sometimes you can use uh, a little trick to kind of help you a little bit, such as a, a bow tie or something which is just three moving averages. But for the most part, look at the charts and draw your arrows. Again, keep it simple. Now, technical analysis leads away, but it doesn't have to be that technical. And that's one thing that I get into in the course is that I show the chart uh, with a 1,000 indicators on or maybe 100 indicators more likely. Accurately, I should say. And you can no longer see the chart. Well, what people forget is 
the net net price change, which is the simplest change of all, can be quite telling. So you have to ask yourself, is the market higher, is the market lower, or is the market about the same? And honestly ask yourself that. Now I probably shouldn't um, frame it because I won't be able to make my point. I almost put a slide at the end that I was going to show at the at the at the end of this presentation. Now, you know what? Maybe I'll do that. Okay. So let's just say that if you don't believe me about how people ignore the basics, such as net net, don't believe me. Just watch. Let's let's. You'll see where I'm going with this at the end of the presentation. So let's take a look at the S&P again on a daily basis. Where were we yesterday? 24, 23.44.93. Where were we way back in February? Well, pretty much somewhere around 23.44.93. And if you connect the dots, what do we have? The sideways arrow. Net, net price change. Until you get that down pat and understand that, don't go off chasing any holy grails. Now obviously there's a psychological aspect to trading and you're seeing me talk more and more and write more and more and do more and more videos on that. In fact, it's become the biggest part of the beginner's course. Uh, as I said quite a bit, I intended on doing a trading psychology course it ended up with 14 pages of what I wanted to cover. That's just a to-do list of 14 pages long. So I scrapped it realizing it was going to be a pretty monumental task. And there's a lot of different details that you have to understand. You have to understand some things on a physiological level, like we often talk about how the brain works, specifically the amygdala and all that. And on a psychological level, things such as looking for action, trying to make something happen, control, etc. But when you boil it all down, there's trading psychology the hard way, and there's trading psychology the easy way. The hard way is watching every tick when you don't have to. Now, if you're a day trader, knock yourself out, okay? If that's what you want to do, then do that. Um, I don't want to digress too far, imagine that. But I was at a conference last October, charity conference, which was mostly day traders. And usually when they tell me, oh, it's mostly day traders, I get there and it's not. This particular time, it was. And number one, I think I was the oldest person there. And most everyone in the room was younger than 30 years old. And they were all full of piss and vinegar, okay? And that's great, but you're not going to be able to keep up that lifestyle very long. That I can guarantee, okay? Maybe there's an exception to the norm, and I hate to say that because if you say that, then somebody will say, well, I'm the exception. It's kind of like uh, I was watching a, a, a thing about the brain, uh, a presentation, I forget who was giving it, and they were saying that they were talking about how we process things serially, meaning that we have to change, we have to switch from one to the other. And that's why texting and driving is such a bad idea because you're either texting or you're driving, okay? And his point was there's like a small, tiny, tiny percentage of, of, of the population that has a bit of a talent that could, could do slightly more than one thing at once. And he was hesitant to say that because now everybody's going to think, well, I must be that that one of the gifted few. And that could go off on the whole psychology tangent about trading too. But unless you're one of the gifted few, like a friend of mine who was an ER doctor for, I don't know, maybe 20 years, okay? And the only reason he's no longer an ER doctor is he got in a really bad car wreck. He was rear-ended really badly. And he suffers from back problems now and he can no longer work in an ER. But he's the exception to the norm, and I forget the exact number of years, but when I was in uh, New York, I asked the doctor in the room, what's the burnout rate on an ER doctor? And he says about seven years, but that could be compressed if they're working inner city in a rough area of town because they're going to see a lot more 
uh, action and all. So we're only wired for so many ups and downs. We're only wired for so many decisions. And if you sit there watching that screen all day, you're going to cause a lot of problems. You're also going to micromanage yourself out of perfectly good positions. I'm going to walk you through a position here in one second. That'll make more sense. You're also going to sit there waiting for something to happen and looking at the screen. Trust me, if looking at a screen would make the prices move, I would be one of the richest guys in the world. But I've gotten better over the years. I no longer am crazy with all my monitors and all these different screens flashing and beeping and everything else. I would have it down quite a bit over the years. And now I tend to use my extra monitors more for research and projects. Now, there's an easier way to this. Now, I don't want to make it sound like Ron Papil's Showtime Rotisserie 2000 Chicken Cook and Grill, or whatever he calls it, where you set it and forget it, but in some cases, it can be. So, I often say busy traders make good traders. They trade only when they have to. And then they go off and save lives, build buildings, and do other great things, and possibly spend time with their loved ones. As I preach over and over, a client of mine tends to overtrade here and there and put his account into a downward spiral. And he called me a while back and said, hey, hey Dave, my trade's improving. I'm getting a lot better at this. I'm like, well, what happened? Did you, did you, did you see the light, or did you... Did you finally figure out exactly, he's actually a good stock picker, so not, not the stock picking, but did, did your stock picking become incredibly better or did, you know, what happened? He says, well, I, my doctor at the hospital quit. And now I'm working in the clinic during the days and the hospitals at night. I'm literally working day and night. Really don't have time to trade, so I'm only taking the trades that look really good. Well, that's the secret to trading right there. Only take the trades that look really good. Don't make unnecessary decisions. So in a long, along the lines of keeping it simple, here's a trend knockout type of setup. Now I did go a little sideways and so I guess that's a little confusing because you say, well Dave, it went a little sideways. But did notice that it did make some new highs in here. It had a bit of what I call a double top knockout move. And also the magnitude of this move was such that it needed a little consolidation. That's okay. But then you can see pretty obvious trend knockout type of move. It should stick out like a sore thumb on the best positions in the world. So you could find a trade like this in less than 20 minutes if you're going through your scans. Now, I do spend a lot more time doing market, market analysis, sector analysis, going through the IPOs, going through my momentum list to get a really good feel for everything. I look at a couple thousand stocks every night. It's a couple thousand charts, I should say, every night. But as far as setups, when, it, when you have a good setup like this, it's going to jump out at you, and I put less than 20 minutes, but if I'm running my scan and not just going through the entire database, I'll usually see this in less than five minutes, maybe less than two or three minutes, okay? Because I can get down to the stocks with the volatility that's just about right for the market pretty quickly. I can go through a couple hundred stocks in maybe a minute or two, and then that's about where these stocks, a stock like this at least at this particular time would be setting up. So I could find a, tr a setup like this, if it exists, obviously, in less than 20 minutes. And then I could plan the trade pretty quickly. I could just eyeball a stock and say, okay, well, you know, in this particular case, we could enter somewhere in here. And then maybe we'll give the stop a little bit more room and not put it quite below the low. So you can find a trade in less than 20 minutes, plan the trade in less than a minute. And then place your order after the open on where you're going to get in. That takes less than a minute, okay? Go about your life. In this particular case, you could have placed a stop entry order, meaning that if it triggers you in, it triggers you in, and then you can go about your life. And then you go ahead and place a stop order, just in case you're wrong. Now, if stock rallies up, you take partial profits, which takes how long? Less than a minute. Now, 
I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but maybe you could put a limit order in place, okay? Maybe you could have had a limit order in place and then went off and played golf and or sat on your boat or do whatever you want to do, save some lives. And then you get an email or an alert or whatever saying, hey, you got triggered into this position. That makes my life a lot easier sometimes is I'll just put in not so much a limit order because I'll have an alert on that. But as far as like the entry, I'll put in a stop order on the entry and go about my life. Now, to trail your stop takes less than a minute. And in a case like this, once you let that stop widen out, because remember, we go in for a swing trade with a fairly tight stop, but then we let it widen out and make the transition after taking partial profits to a longer term trader. There's nothing to do. So I put zero minutes here to one minute. So you could actually leave that stop in once it gets that far away. Now, obviously, a little discretion helps just in case there's a, a huge overnight gap. But once it gets a far, long ways away, you can leave a hard stop in place and go about your life. So from this point forward here, this is about one week. This is, let's see, this is almost one week, and this is a month. So in round numbers, you have six weeks. And this is trading weeks. It's actually one month, one and a half months, maybe even more than one and a half months on the chart. Let's see, this is a month. It's about a half a month, almost a half a month. So, you know, you're looking at almost two months, six weeks or so of trading, roughly two months on a calendar basis. But it's nothing to do. But I guarantee you, somebody is trying to micro, somebody has already micromanaged themselves out of it or is watching this chart every day, every day, every day, every tick. And there's really not anything to do. So again, my point is that trading is not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as most try to make it. And if you start with just one simple pattern, like we talked about last week, like a persistent pullback, or in this case, like we just went over a minute ago, a persistent trend with a TKO, and become successful with that, successful with that, follow the money management, make sure you follow position management, enter only for triggers, take partial profits if blessed, let yourself stop out if you're wrong, okay? Let yourself eventually stop out on the trade when you're eventually wrong, because in the end, what happens? You trend's a friend until it ends, right? Become successful at that, it's kind of like a just do it, okay? And don't watch that screen every single minute of every single day. Keep yourself busy. Go about your life. Once you become successful with that, then start adding in new patterns. And maybe do something more complex, slightly more complex, I should say. Not too complex. But something slightly more complex, like a bow tie type of pattern, where you're looking to get into a trend a little bit earlier such as a transition. So trading's not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as moats try to make it. Another thing I saw in this uh, Tim Ferriss interview was he talked about sometimes you should scratch your own itch, or I don't think he said sometimes, you should always. And I wasn't sure exactly where he was going with that, but he talked about when he started his podcast, which is one of the most popular podcasts out there now, and... Call me, Tim. <laughs> um, when he started his podcast, he was worried about his audience at first, and then he started to think, well, I know I have an audience of one because I want to do this for me. And in doing that and filling that need and scratching that itch, it became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's how he got started. So along the lines of what I was saying with the beginners course is, yeah, I have to say, what what does my audience want for the utmost be beginner? But what would someone who's much more seasoned, what may have they lost sight of? What would I go back and tell that younger punk version of me? And also, what would I have to force myself to go back and watch when I try to start outsmarting the markets or outthinking the markets. And we're all human and we're all going to go through bad times. I don't know, 
McDonald's out there. I just fed that son of a gun. <laughs> anyway, so sometimes you just have to return to the basics and keep it simple. And I think you can be successful with just the basics. And here's the deal. If you're not successful with just the basics, you're not going to be more successful with more complex things. Now, this show kind of took a bit of a turn this morning because I woke up, went to bed thinking about certain things a little bit deeper into psychology than I got into uh, over the last few minutes. And that's kind of like where the, sh the show really wasn't headed in that direction, but then I started putting my slides together, and then it kind of made a turn. But initially, I was going to talk about some deeper psychological issues, and then I was going to build the base by saying some things that you're going to need. And if you're going to be successful as a trader, you're going to need some help. And I, I, I get people all the time, not that I'm the grand poobah or anything, but they're like, hey, Dave, I want to I wanna do it on my own. It's like, well, okay, there's nothing wrong with getting a little help. We all get a little help. I learn from a lot of people. I'm still learning from a lot of people. Like little things like an exponential moving average will tick up as soon as the price closes above it. It's like I had no idea. It worked like that. I knew how it worked from an empirical standpoint, but I had no idea. So no one is self-made. Even if you think you're self-made, you got help along the way. You didn't become a doctor by reading a book. And if you did, well, somebody wrote the book. So it's okay to get help. We all get help. Early on, I was very lucky. Okay, I, I consider myself blessed. I wait Every time I turn my screens on, I think about this. I was able to hook up with some old school traders very early on. I had a hedge fund hire me to consult with them to do their technical analysis early on. Okay, I had a good grasp of technical analysis, but there's a lot of other things I didn't know at the time. So between the seasoned traders and the seasoned traders, what I think would that help me the most there? I was thinking about this yesterday is that being able to see someone who has traded for a while who was wildly bullish all of a sudden start becoming bearish like a switch flipped when the market began to drop. And I could plainly see the market was dropping, but I was busy fighting the last war. Just seeing that psychological change was a godsend for me. So we all get help. And... You're going to need some money. Now, I've, I've fleshed these things out in a lot more details in my column. And I think I had a list of uh, many, a list at least 10 or 20 or so that I've written about extensively on the website. But these are just a few things I was thinking about when I first came in today. You're going to need some money to trade, okay? And even if you can afford to trade, you're going to need some money to trade. And where I'm going with that is I've seen wealthy clients – put 25k in account and then they do pretty good with it but then they kind of when they hit a little bit of a downward spiral they tend to mess things up a bit and they tend to not see it as a pure trading account okay and what they should do is they should adequately fund an account and see it as a trading account and leave it alone by not seeing it as a trading account, what I mean is they monetize their gains and then they stress out over their losses as opposed to just saying, this is a trading account. I'm going to follow my rules. I'm going to follow the system. I'm going to follow along. But instead, a lot of these other bad behaviors, again, like monetizing those open gains and so on and so forth. And, and sometimes gambling with the money and gambling in the markets with the money instead of following the system. Now, even if you don't have any money, you can and should learn, okay? I would say spend what little money you have on, on education. Now, some of that money will be a waste if it's, you know, because there's a lot of BS out there. But overall, if you keep a common sense and conceptually correct approach, it's going to be money, for the most part, well spent. 
okay? Because, not to be egotistical, but if I could save you from getting into one bad trade by requiring that you have to have some sort of significant net-net move or persistency or acceleration, all these things I preach about, followed by a setup, followed by an entry, then you saved 10 times the amount that you spent on a course. You, sp you save if you learn the money management where you're ironing your stocks, you're taking partial profits, you're positioning yourself to stick with a longer-term trend, then one trade will pay for 10 courses. So rather than take a little money you have and spend it in the school of hard knocks, get educated first. And then the other thing you could do without any money is paper trade. And as I've said before, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. So paper trade until you get it down pat. Paper trade until you figure it out. And you could do that without money. Now, one thing that people lose sight of is that you're going to need a support mechanism. And I've talked with someone before, and this is, you know, it's been more than one person. But one that stands out is when I said, okay, you're not following the rules. And he knew he was not following the rules. And I said, would you be willing to get your wife involved in your trading? Would you let her look over your shoulders? Would you explain to her specifically what you're doing and why you're doing it? And he said, no, that would end our marriage. So he knew he's doing a wrong thing, and he also knew that if he brought someone in, they would point out that he's doing the wrong thing. I, I've never lost any women, woman clients. I've had one woman client not follow the rules and then went off and, and chased a lot of rainbows and, 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 and sort of gambled in the markets. I'm not sure what happened. And I think she blew up. But other than that, at least no one's told me. I haven't had any women who were not successful following along, either directly or indirectly. By directly, I mean following my trading service. Indirectly, I mean following the trading system. I've never known any woman, so far at least, that hasn't been successful. And I think the reason there is because they're following the methodology, they're following the system, and who was it? A famous hedge fund manager escapes me at the moment. Um, I don't think it was Drucker Miller, but it was one of those guys. I, it's, it's on my website somewhere if you do a search. But he said that women are too emotional to trade. Well, women might be emotional, but an ego trumps emotion when it comes to bad behaviors. And this is why I have seen, seen, seen <laughs> a lot more successful women, percentage-wise at least, because there's a much smaller percentage of women that are trading. But percentage-wise, the chance of success for a woman is better than a man because the man has the ego. Now, one thing I see quite often is the when it comes time to renew the trading service, guys will drop out because their spouses want them to justify the expense and they're losing money. Well, they're losing money because one, now let's be frank here, maybe maybe it's because they haven't caught a good cycle yet, okay? And that cycle does take time, sometimes six to eight months. So that might be part of the problem. But bigger than that usually is that they're not following the system they're doing. They're taking trades outside of the system. They're day trading. They're, there's a host of other bad behaviors, and they're losing money because of that. Not that I have the be all end all. And, and again, I'm not the grand poobah, but I chip away at it with a conceptually correct approach, and you should too. And I'd be willing to bet that if these traders, these guys, were willing to get their spouses involved and said, "Hey," I'm taking this trade. Here's the setup. It's it's in this nice persistent trend uh, on a net net basis. It's gone this far. 
the volatility is about right because it's it's a more slightly more volatile stock, but not too volatile. And we've got this nice trend knockout move. I'm going to put the entry right here, put the stop it right here. And then this is how I'm going to do it. And if they did that on the trades, then they would follow the system. And obviously, there's no guarantees in this business. You want to guarantee, go buy a toaster. But I guarantee you, they'll be a lot more successful than someone who just wings it and then goes off and makes 100 day trades in frustration or over leverages or fights the trend or calls a top and the list goes on and on and on. So make sure you have support of significant others. Now, initially what I was thinking is if your wife's against you or your spouse is against you, then you're kind of doomed from the start. So you have to convince them that you're going to go about this in a methodical type of manner. And answering to someone can be tough, okay? But you will need the support and approval of the others. And you have to let them know, this is the money we're going to put aside in our trading account. And this is what we're going to do with it. We're going to trade. We're going to follow this plan. You're also going to need a lot of patience. And as I often preach, you're going to have to seek that action elsewhere. Okay? You want action? Have an affair. That way you don't lose half your money, right? Obviously, I'm joking, but... You're going to have to find some other form of entertainment, okay? Trading done properly could be quite boring. Go back to that trade we just looked at, the KEM. We've been sitting in this thing for a couple of months, and it's been grinding sideways. It's boring us, okay? That's fine, though. It's just making this big old base. And as I often preach, the bigger the base, the further the launch into space. There's no guarantee of that. But, you know, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. I would encourage you after the show to go in and find big bases within longer-term trends. In other words, look for stocks historically and markets that have had nice bases like this, just straight sideways, after a massive, massive trend. And I'd be bet willing to bet more often than not after that big base, they take off again. Because this gives everybody a time, this lets things equalize out. This helps that overbought market work off, walk off, I should say, that overbought condition. It helps people jockey for positions. Now, a lot of people might say that's enough, it's high enough, it can't go any higher, so they get out, okay? And when this market starts higher again, what do they have to do? They have to put up a shut up. So there's a psychological basis of other players it all is. In fact, everything I do has a psychological basis. So I'm okay when a market goes sideways after I get in. Would I get in a market that's going straight sideways? Absolutely not. But once I'm in and once I have a position and once I've taken my partial profits, then I'm in longer term trend following mode and a longer term trend is still up. Well, how do I know when the trend ends? Well, I have a stop in place, okay? And then I'll get stopped out. All right, James says, markets appear to me to be highly random, and frequently the patterns I see are projections of my imagination. Okay? Or if the patterns themselves are objectively there, they fail. Does randomness not make trading very difficult? How can this be avoided when, when it is a central feature of markets? Well, markets could be choppy, obviously. But there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily random. For instance, I was just talking about a base, okay? Well, first of all, there's either supply, there's demand, or there's equilibrium, okay? When a market goes sideways, there's equilibrium. Everyone tends to agree upon price, okay? But let's say that market begins to drop. So that means some supply came into the market. 
Now, people sell for a variety of reasons, many of which have nothing to do with the underlying market. Okay, like Tom McClellan's mom once said, some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money. Well, I'll just use more sophisticated methods. I think the full quote is everyone uses time and investments, and then she said that. But now if you think about it, this market is going to have a hard time getting back through this overhead supply. Okay? That's not random. That's a fact. Because anyone who bought during this range is going to look at get, look to get out of break even. They want to get their money back. Okay? So that's not random. A trend, if you have an established trend, is not random. That means there's demand coming into the market. And a lot of times, higher prices beget higher prices. Because let's say somebody wanted to buy, somebody was looking at the stock back here, and it starts going up. Well, at some point, they're going to have to put up or shut up. Okay? Think about that trend knockout pattern. Everybody who bought along the way, you'll have some people that are knocked out. Okay? Obviously, if it begins to sell off hard, somebody's going to get scared out, okay? And then the eager shorts are going to think, hey, guess what? I'm going to short this market too. Well, what would happen if, if it triggers and goes back up? There's a psychological basis behind all this. But yes, quite often it could seem random, especially once you get into position. But I would encourage you to go back and look at every position you take in perfect hindsight and see if that big blue arrow was on the chart, okay? Or obviously some sort of obvious type of transition. But until you can become profitable trading in the direction of the big blue arrow, don't experiment with transitions, okay? Keep it simple to become successful. So it can seem random, but I'll tell you this. If you start looking at... 2,000 charts every night, okay? And then you can maybe whittle it down to, let's just say, at least the first 1,500 fairly more liquid, more volatile stocks within the tradable universe. If you start doing that every night, day after day after day after day after day, you're going to see some reoccurring patterns. You're going to see some big up arrows on the charts, okay? You're going to see some bases, and you're going to see some other things. But that's how I discovered everything I know about the markets, at least from a from everything that wasn't taught, I should say. I, earlier I said I did have a little help. I did read some books. I did have a lot of help from some seasoned traders and some money managers, et cetera. So, you know, every now and then I feel like, oh, I'm self-taught. And it's like, well, no, you're not. <laughs> you had plenty of mentors along the way. You still do. But you will see a lot. You will learn a lot. You will teach yourself a lot, and then which will later be confirmed in other places. I remember first time I saw I showed my publisher a pattern that was going to be in the book. He's like, "I know that pattern." I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, shoot." He goes, "No, no, no. I just mean I've seen that reoccur in the charts over and over again. It's just it wasn't like it was something he had already written about or something he was already trading. He's like." I've seen that pattern. And so, yeah, empirical research is going to help you tremendously. And that's free. Uh, other than the course uh, costs you data feed. But that's a wonderful thing to do. Now, again, it can be, uh, it can feel a little random at times. And you can get a little down in the dumps when the market's not going your way. But as long as you're following your plan and picking the best and leaving the rest, then it comes with the territory. Okay, there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs. Um, going through this whole, going back to the beginning for me was a huge help. Okay? And I was thinking about it this morning. It's like I'm looking at a couple of positions that came dangerously close to the stop and then took off. Now, the old me, going back 15 years, 20 years, would have probably micromanaged myself out, saying, ah, it's enough pain, I can't take it anymore, let me get out. The new improved version just honors a stop. And I should say, 
going back a few years or even a few months, I would probably cuss and fuss quite a bit, still honor my stop, still let it go down towards a stop, but I would waste a lot of mental energy in the process. So as long as you're following a plan, as long as you have a solid plan in place, and again, like I said earlier, if you wanted to if you want to make sure you follow that plan, then involve somebody else who you're trading, okay? And what I'm talking about here is I've had several positions, mostly in Forex lately. Forex can be a little choppy. It's a lot harder to trade than individual stocks. But I've had a few positions. Let me show you alongside, make life easier. But I've had a few positions I've been trend following mode in. Come down and do this. Begin to take off. I'm like, oh, that's great. Come down and do this two or three times and then take off nicely. Now, I'm not happy when they're down here, but I'm having more of a so what attitude than I used to. So what? Stops out, it stops out, okay? Especially if it's at a profit, like this two or three positions were recently. It's not always a profit, obviously. But now I have a bit of a so what attitude. I, mean, I tried to explain this flippant uh, attitude that you have to have to trade. And I think I kind of failed miserably, but I think I'm going to get there. I'm going to keep talking about it until I get there. You have to have a, I could care less, stops out, stops out. You know why? Because I'm following a plan. Okay? And then go back to trend following once it starts going higher again. I know it's easier said than done, but making more and more observations and overthinking it can really stress you out. There you go, Chris. Chris says, I've had numerous stocks graze my stop only to reverse and hit my initial profit target within a few weeks. Now, are you saying that it actually hit, it actually stopped you out before it hit the profit target or just grazed your stop? Now, this is a lesson, this is lesson 2.0, okay? Sometimes, let's say you have a, let's start over. Now, we talked about this quite a bit in these presentations, but no, Gray's didn't sell. Okay, cool. Yeah, so what he's saying, just like what I was just saying, is sometimes let's say you got a stop in place and it comes down, it just almost gets there and it takes off again. You know, my, my story here, as I said a thousand times, I shorted Dell once at 55, called my dad up and said, hey, dad, let's short some Dell. Looks like it's in trouble. And then, uh, I forget exactly how it went down. My stop was at 55, okay? I forget where I shorted. Shorted probably down here somewhere, about 50 or something. And my stop was at 55. And when it got to 57 and 7 eighths, they traded at eights back then, I cashed out of the position, called my father, made him cash out, and then Dell went down to single digits. That was back when they cooked the books. And... I had nearly the high in the stock. This was long before I knew what I knew now about trading. But it's a great example of micromanaging. So, yeah, the old OB would have said, you know what, I can't take it anymore. Get me out of this thing. Now, lesson 2.0 that I was going to mention is, let's say you come, it comes down and just kind of touches that stop and take it begins to take off a little bit, like somewhere in here, whatever. It's okay to have that stop pull before the open see if it reverses and then put that stop back in if it reverses. And if it doesn't, you just lose an incremental amount more than you would have anyway. Good for you, Chris. Angelo is full of something, not piss and vinegar. <laughs> Testosterone, I guess would be the word. Hi, Dave. I screwed up my position size on two recent entries. All right, well, that's that's the first step to getting better is recognizing a mistake, right? And purchase more shares than I should have, okay? Well, before you go any further, what you want to do, I can't pull it up now because it's got live trades, but um, what you want to do, get the spreadsheet from me, and when you punch in your, if you put your account size up here and you punch in your, uh, position and your entry and your stop, it's going to automatically calculate the number of shares for you, okay? So, I know, easier said than done, but all you have to do is buy that amount of shares. 
Okay. I ended up risking more like 4%. I'm sticking to the plan as I think it's the best move. Lesson learned. Simple mistakes can really bite you to rear end. Yeah, you know, you got to be careful. And the, the problem with, with, with putting 4% into a trade instead of 2% is uh, if it pays off big, the market has taught you to take excessive risk. Okay. So what you might want to do is look to be a little bit more aggressive in, in scaling out on that position should it move in your favor. I mean, you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place when you when you over leverage on a position like that. Okay. And you know, it's it's a lot easier not to have a problem to begin with than it is to fix a problem. Okay. Because fixing a problem, you, you kind of got to go outside the methodology to figure out what you need to do. But you might want to be really careful in that. <laughs> All right, let's hop to the charts. First thing I want to do is I want to, uh, oh, before we do that, it's happening, okay? I keep threatening this course. I know you guys are sick of hearing about it. But I'm really excited about it, and, and it's and like I said, it's 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 really it's really helped me on a psychological level to stop stressing so much when my stop is getting neared, or if I don't have anything to show my clients, or for me to trade, to be patient, and a host of other bad behaviors, especially on a psychological level. But anyway, I'll have this I'll have this site up. At least the coming soon countdown, no sooner, no later than uh, next next week, and then that's going to be part of the learning management system. I was able to tweak that earlier this week, and the infrastructure I think is pretty much there. And the great thing about a learning management system is, <laughs> I'll give you a case in point. Like somebody's been emailing me for fifteen years. Okay, slight exaggeration. I think it was eleven years. And I'm like, this guy must be mentally challenged. And I actually thought about it in a lot more politically incorrect way, if you can imagine. Asking me all these questions and all these questions. And I'm thinking like, geez, I covered this in my first book alone. And finally I said, reread the book. Oh, I've been meaning to get that. <laughs> so... The learning management system is going to solve that problem. If somebody is looking at a stock that's gone sideways for three months, I can look in and see what modules they've covered, and I can say, go in and rewatch the module with net-net price change. Okay? If someone is risking 10% on a, on a trade and had a god-awful blow-up on that, Go in and rewatch the money management module. Oh, you didn't watch that yet. Oh, okay. I see you. <laughs> Go in and pass the quiz on that. There's going to be a quiz. So I'll know. Anyway, pretty excited about that too. I know I'm a nerd. I don't care. Um, you know, I keep I put this in every week. Make sure you're on the late service. Um, the late service hadn't been updated in a while uh, because we had a position that that went a long time without triggering. And now we have another one in there that's going a long time without triggering. And these are IPO type setups, which can take longer than the normal trigger period. So that's why it's one thing I didn't think about when I put out the delayed service. I thought when I said, okay, I'll put a delayed service for free, it'll always be one week behind and sometimes even less. Well, unfortunately, I didn't really think about that. So that's why it hasn't updated a while. But at least you can get the archives there. And I promise... Tonight, I will uh, I'll catch it up as much as I can. And then, obviously, go to my website if you want some stuff. All right, let's get to the charts. Hey, Steve. Um, if you guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. I'll walk you through the market real quick, what I'm seeing, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at your picks. Be happy to. Donald, that's the setup of the day. Good job. Congratulations. I cannot talk about it because of that. But Donald is uh, Donald's on it. Good job, Donald. All right, let's take a look at the market here, and let's take a look at a few sectors, et cetera, 
and see if we can get a kind of feel for what's going on. Well, already lectured quite a bit on the sideways nature of the market, so that's out of the way. So it has been pretty much sideways. It's also been a little range bound in here, as you can see. Kind of flat spill today, and again sideways since what, middle of November? So when you see a market that starts doing this, we might have to sit on our hands a little bit. Now, that doesn't mean that if you bought some stock back here that you should bail out because, look, it went sideways here. And what did I just say? Identify a trend and then see if it bases it takes off again, okay? Identify a trend, see if it bases and takes off again, okay? This might be the end. You know, these, these people that are, that are, the sky is falling and all these bears come out the woodwork. Maybe it is, okay? But put your ego aside, okay? And give it a little time and give it the benefit of the doubt and see what happens. Now, the moving averages have flattened out. They're beginning to turn down a little bit. But it's still not the end of the world, nor can you see it from here. But... But Dave, how will I know when to get out? Well, your stop is going to take you out, okay? Now, we have put on one short, and we saw a bunch of shorts in the banks. But we had one short in the financials trigger, MS. So we have one short on during this little slide, but that's about it. So that might help a little bit if it does begin to slide. If the market turns right back up, we'll lose in that trade. So what? And then the longs will go back to making money. So get your ego out the way. Just honor your stop, okay? Now, the other thing you need to do is say, well, wait a minute, Dave. This market's going sideways. Should I still be buying it? The answer is no. No with caveats. You want to be super-duper selective on any new longs. Same sort of action in NASDAQ, sideways trading range. But look at this. Nice little... Nice little uptrend, okay? Air on the side of the longer term trend, okay? That's okay to fire off a short or two. We fired off some shorts back here. We were heavily short coming into 2016. And then the market turned around and went back up, okay? But we get paid to trade. As Greg Moore says, treat all signals as if they will become the big one. We don't have any signals yet, okay? Russell 2000, massive, massive base. The bigger the base, the bigger the launch in the space. Not always, but that's the side you should bet on. You should bet on the side of the trade, I should say. Um, sector action, getting pretty mixed out there. Energies are just kind of bumping along. I wouldn't take any energy trades. We've got a little overhead supply there. They're just kind of bumping around. So forget about that. They're random if you want to label them. Metals and mining sold off fairly hard yesterday, selling off a little bit today. Gold notwithstanding, gold's kind of worked its way higher, but gold's kind of wide and loose in here. Now, if something looks random, the great thing is you just avoid it, okay? This looks random to me. There's no pattern here that I want to trade. Banks look like they're still in a little bit of trouble. Now, this was not random, okay? We had a bow tie off of all-time highs. Bow tie was right here. This is why I was bearish on the banks and the financials. Let's take a look at MS and the financials, okay? This is not random, okay? It took out this base and then set up, set up as a bow tie. This is a pretty obvious pattern to me, almost too obvious, okay? So that's a stock that looks like it's in trouble. That's a financial stock, okay? What's the rest of the brokerage just looking like? Let's jump to the sub-industry, national brokerages. You can see brokerages look like they're in a little bit of trouble. This is the overall sector, okay? This is not random, okay? Chopping sideways seems random, but that's just a sideways move. Let's draw our lines here. Up, sideways. And now down, okay? Now, I understand it will take a little experience to see that, and maybe I'm oversimplifying it. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? And as you get a little bit more experience, 
is it making a transition to a different trend? And right now, the brokerages, financials in general, let's take a look at XLF, okay, could be in trouble. You got a bow tie here, a little bit of a pullback so far, selling off a little bit. Doesn't mean that they won't stop tomorrow and go straight back up. But when you see a market begin to roll over like that, you A, want to honor your stops on any existing positions, and B, maybe fire off a short or two. So the point I'm trying to make with the sector action is it's getting a little choppy out there. It's getting a little sideways. No big shocker. The overall market, a little choppy and sideways. Okay. Now, you don't want to fight the last battle. I've I'm, I'm been a bull on the semiconductors for a long, long time. And we're still on chem, K-E-M, okay? And you can see longer-term uptrend so far remains intact here. But if you throw the bow ties in, you can see, well, wait a minute. Looks like the bow ties have been turned down. So I wouldn't rush out and go short crazy. But I'm going to need to see the mother of all setups before getting long because maybe this is just a pullback of this longer-term trade. We won't know until after the fact. But we do know that, what? It's gone sideways for how long? Two months, okay? Two months sideways movement. So in order for me to buy a semiconductor right now, it's going to have to be the mother of all setups. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. One thing good about bonds is they're at these multi-month highs, and they've come out of this bottoming formation. Now, I wouldn't run out and buy bonds, and one reason is because they're not coming off. Well, I guess they're coming off a of multi-year lows. That's, that's a good thing. But bonds, it's going to be hard to make money in bonds because they're a very efficient type of market. But the good news is we not see, we're not seeing this route lower that we saw late last year. So the market is no longer, at least for the time being, worried about interest rates. So that's a good thing. Put that in the plus column. Now, again, the rest of the sector is kind of mixed, and anything technology now is in longer-term uptrend, shorter-term consolidation, okay? And we don't know if that consolidation is going to become more than just a consolidation. In other words, it's going to roll over, or is this the base it's going to launch off of? We don't know yet, okay? That's okay not to know, okay? But what you do to avoid put cap, putting capital into harm's way is you make sure you really, really like the setup, okay? Let's just take a look at the transports, and then we'll get to your stock questions. Trannies are pretty sideways in here. One can maybe argue kind of head and shouldery looking, okay? Um, but I don't see any reason to get too excited just yet. As I've said before, or ad nauseum, I don't trade directly off of classical technical analysis, but I do factor it into my trading in that, if we see a bow tie or a first thrust or something coming off of a major head and shoulder top, then we might take action. We don't rush out and trade a head and shoulder top in and of itself. All right, let's take a look at your stock picks in here. X looks dead. All right, let's take a look at that. Yeah, X is uh, looks like it could be a little trouble in here. As I said earlier, metals and mining not looking so great. Okay, let me see if I can find this window. It won't let me move this window around. Let's see. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Let's back the chart out a little bit. And, yeah, it stalls short of this prior peak. Let's put in some moving averages. Kind of bow tied down, but kind of a sloppy bow tie. Actually, it didn't really bow tie right here, but it already rolled over by that point anyway. So, yeah, it looks like it's in trouble. I'm not really seeing a setup here. Maybe if it drops a little further and, and pulls back a little bit, then you've got all this overhead supply to deal with. So I hear you. Dominic has been waiting patiently for CMG. Um, yeah, it's making new highs in here, so that's certainly a good thing. Let's back the chart out. Um, I would like to see this one make much more highs, continue higher, and then maybe look to play some pullbacks along the way. I think you could probably find something a little bit better at this point because 
it's kind of in the middle of this big longer term range. And that's kind of extreme. It's kind of an extreme example. But I think you could probably find something with the market not too far from all-time highs. Either find something that's nearing all-time highs or like the shippers lately. We've been, I've been kind of bullish on those guys now today, notwithstanding the last few days, notwithstanding. Maybe something coming off of a little bit more major lows like the shippers. This is salt. We're long this stock right now. Pi, P-I, or P-L? P-I? Yeah, Pi has become wide and loose. This is one we played, uh, I think, way back here as an IPO. It was a fun ride. In fact, I did a couple of articles, easy as Pi, P-I, a little play on words there. I'm so punny. But, yeah, this is just kind of wide and loose. There's really no structure or pattern here. So uh, getting back to what someone was saying earlier, that it's random. So there's nothing to do. Okay. Frack, if it accelerates and pulls back. That's a lot of things to do. Yeah, frack is a frack is a poster child for don't buy IPOs unless they go up. Okay. And you can see that it's it's really sold off hard. Now I'm okay with an IPO if it comes public and then bottoms out over months and months and months and then begins to take off. That's kind of a uh, I guess when I do the IPO course 2.0, I'll probably throw in a uh, toddler type of pattern, meaning that the IPO has been public for a considerable amount of time. I call them a toddler as opposed to a pure IPO. But there is a bit of a Phoenix characteristic that I've studied with IPOs where when they come public and die, sometimes they bottom out over months and then take off again. And in a case like this, I would not be too excited to rush out and buy it. It's kind of like Snap. There's a lot of bad memory so far in this IPO. So I didn't get too excited on this reversal here, and I avoided the stock just because I think there's too many bad memories coming public so high and kind of dying out right away. There's still a lot of people that are looking to get off the hook. Now, the, the great thing about the Phoenix type of strategy uh, would be that if it went down and then bottomed out for a long, 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 long time, which I can't draw on this chart, then that's a different story because all that supply works its way through the system. LL for Mr. John. Hopefully he watches the rerun. Yeah, this looks okay. Um, you know, back the chart out a little bit. You can see it's breaking out uh, off of, over these uh, multi-year highs. It's pulled back a little bit. They had obviously had a lot of trouble way back here. You will hit some, um, all these gaps in trading along the way. Could put a little pressure on the position, that's the only problem. Remember, markets have long, long, long memory sometimes, even though a lot of the supply has likely worked its way through the market. Um, I'm gonna give it an okay. Um, I would like to see more days in this trend at new highs, but it's certainly okay. You could certainly do much worse. That's definitely a breakout followed by a pullback, okay? I would probably avoid it just because I'm a perfectionist, but it certainly looks okay. This longer term trading way back here, believe it or not, would, would aggravate me or, or would keep me from taking it. F as a short, just annoy Don. <laughs> yeah, Phil's been in for a while. Where is Don? We had Don, the Ford guy, every week asked about sh shorting, not shorting, buying Ford. Uh, no, it's just, it's at too low levels, you know. Uh, find something, of course, this is a very efficient and thick stock, hard to trade. Uh, but efficient stocks, can be okay coming off of high levels. Like take a look at the EMS, for instance. Not to talk my position, but it's coming off of all-time highs or multi-year highs beginning to break down. This is where you want to get in a short, somewhere on the fringe up here, as opposed to it's something that's already scraping bottom. Unless you're in a market like 2008, where everything's in a downtrend, then you're forced to trade existing downtrends uh, or uh, trend resumption type patterns. What do you think about the threatening bow tie SPX? Daily two months. Looks like a MS did before it gave away. Yeah, I hear you, Craig. Uh, let's take a look. You will talk about it on spiders. Well, um, first of all, indices are a lot more efficient than an individual stock. Even an efficient stock like MS. Um, a thicker, higher vol volume stock will have more efficiency, meaning that it tends to trade where it should. 
but the, the scale can be tipped there when the market begins to roll over or when the stock begins to roll over. So it's not quite a bow tie. What I'm seeing now is not a tight, tight bow tie. Notice that it's sloppy, okay? The 10 went below, and then it came back up, and now it's going back down. And then the 20 hasn't crossed yet, neither has a 30. With a bow tie, you want to see things a little tighter. Let's go back to that MS. Notice that the bow tie crossed fairly quickly and fairly obviously in this particular case, okay? So when you see a sloppy bow tie, it just means that a market is consolidating. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that a market's in good shape. Sometimes you might get a sloppy bow tie and then it goes on and makes the final top, okay? Like you see right here, it was trying to bow tie down this particular stock, MS, and then it went on to make new highs. Sometimes it'll do this, go up a little bit more, and then make the real bow tie. But I don't see anything to get worried about too much just yet in the S&P 500. And Russell 2000, same thought of thing. Tried to make a bow tie here, kind of got sloppy, went on to make new highs, sort of made a bow tie here, okay, and now it's kind of coming back up. So I'd be more worried about something like the Russell, but then you can see you got a crossing here, and then you got a crossing back here. So that's just kind of a sloppy uh, bow tie. So maybe you want to back out to like a three-day chart or a two-day chart or something and try to gleam, see if you can gleam a little bit more insight into what's going on, okay? So a tight bow tie indicates a switch flip rather than being a so-so indecision. Yeah, a tight bow tie, well, take a look at the Russell right here. It's pretty obvious, okay? You had a tight bow tie back, back there. And all that means is that the cycles have changed sort of abruptly because you've got a 10-day moving average, simple, 20-day exponential moving average, and a 30-day exponential moving average, and they all turn down, they all cross fairly quickly. So that tells you that something has changed, okay? And then when you eyeball the chart, you see, oh, yeah, the chart has sold off too. It's not, it's not indicating anything, okay? I wish I could. I wish I could go out and shout from the rooftop how magical bow ties are, and, and how you need to follow along with Big Dave because I have this magical indicator. No, I don't. It just tells me what's already in a chart. It just illustrates what's already there. I bet it's, I, I need to start making this stuff sound more magical. <laughs> it's pretty cool, though. I know I'm a nerd. DJ Twenty is that the, the transports or is that the, the Dow itself? Dow's thirty, right? Yeah, transports. Yeah, uh, you know, the point that's made by Jim is that uh, you could have a bow tie down soon in the transports. Now, here's a kind of an example here. Notice how they got a little sloppy here, sloppy here, sloppy here, didn't quite cross. And then your true bow tie actually happened somewhere in here. Actually, this might be a perfect example either. But it's a lot tighter than it was back here. Now it could come together fairly quickly, fairly tight. So, yeah, we have to pay attention. But the point I'm trying to make is I'm not going to rush out and call a bear market just yet, okay? Now, I got bearish a while back when we had a weekly bow tie because every one for the last 30 years has been incredible. And luckily, and I'm glad I was somewhat wrong on that, I think that the Russell 2000 dropped almost 20% or 17 18% from the bow tie. So that was a legitimate signal, at least in Russell. And then we did get some shorts off, so it just didn't turn into the mother ball bull market, bear markets, and that's okay with me. All right, um, LTRX, it's too thin. Um, yeah, be careful, but it's not super duper thin, but it's pretty thin. Uh, can be a little choppy, a little wide and loose, volatility fairly high. Um, yeah, it's okay. I'll give it a not bad. Um, you know, maybe a little bit deeper pullback, but that's that's you could certainly do a lot worse than that, okay, uh, except that it's really thin. Maybe if you did decide to enter in or above one of these highs in here, let it prove itself a little bit. But that's that's not bad, Larceny, I, I have to say. Brett wants to know about ASPS. Yeah, put it in your watch list. I've been see, I've been kind of amazed by this one because it's a real estate. It's a REIT, and REITs are pretty boring, but you got one taken off in here. But, yeah, it's not set up right now. Uh, Brett, that's actually set up for today, so good job on that one. Congratulations. Rocks for Donald. Uh, well, 
it's kind of wide loose way back here, and it's just kind of pushing into it all at wide loose action. And then, like I said last week, it never really cleared this prior peak, so let's leave that alone for now. GFI for Steve. GFI. Um, these gold stocks have a lot of bad memories to them right now. I think I would pass. I, I kind of wish these gold stocks would have just went down and made the mother ball bottoms and then take off again. But right now, gold's kind of mid-range. Um, I'm not really going after any goals right now. Okay, Rick. Hey, Rick, you guessed the setup of the day. Good job with you. Can't talk about it, though. TTPH, also for Mr. Rick. Yeah, we talked about this one last week or week before. Too much overhead supply, big gap down, leave it alone. I hear you, though. You, you zoom in on it. This one's been catching my eye every day. That's a beautiful setup. That looks fantastic, okay? That's got everything pretty much that you want in a setup, okay? Can you draw a big blue arrow? Okay, who, who earlier said markets are random? Well, markets can be random, but in this case, you've got a nice trend. You've got a nice pullback, okay? So that's a good look at setup, but I can't take it because of these, these aforementioned problems. SBLK, okay, this could be a shipper for oh, Craig. Hey, Craig. Um, it does have some bad memories here and there, but it's also kind of a Phoenix type of stock coming off of lows. It looks okay. I'd actually like to see... A little bit more decisive breakout followed by a pullback, but absolutely keep that on your radar, Craig. G O G. Hey, Dave, I noticed you're a lot nicer to some of the people in here. Yeah, because they're my clients. <laughs> well, this looks good. John, I don't think you're a client. This looks fantastic, uh, except that it needs more pullback. Okay. Now, again, what we'd say earlier about the random thing, this is not random. This is an uptrend. Okay. Now, if you bought this stock and you're watching every little tick of every day, you're probably thinking, oh, my God, this is killing me, okay? So you're like, oh, it's up, it's that, it's up, it's that. It's like a Jackie Mason stock, right? Make you, It'll make you nauseous. But go out and do something and just sit in the stock and forget about it, and your life will get a lot easier. Yeah, that looks good. Um, let it pull back a little bit, though. And it's got some bad memories, but you know what? It's at 10 bucks a share. If it gets to 20 before it stalls out, I'd be a happy camper. So good job on that one, John. Batra, B-A-T-R-A. Uh, well, I don't know what this big stupid bar is here. It's also pretty thin. Um, I think I'd leave it alone. Series A, Class A. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. But, but the, it really has it. It was a 19 here. It's just chopping all around. I mean, wait to see if it has a better trend than that before getting too excited. Rick with DSX, that sounds like a shipper to me. Um, my only problem is it's just got these two really big bars here for its trend, or its breakout, I should say. And then, unlike some of those other shippers, like Salt, which doesn't have anything, any uh, overhead for a long, long time, you got a big wad of overhead resistance right here. So, now it might not, these things I'm talking about might not jump out at you right away, but if you start looking at 2,000 stocks a day, they will. So here we can see a big mound of overhead resistance trying to set up right below it. No. Skip that one. And what was that? GOGL. Uh, look at GOGL. And look at, uh, even look at uh, SALT, okay? Doesn't have any resistance till around 20-something. Okay? Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet, but... It looks okay. I mean, maybe I'm talking about position. It broke out. It kind of knocked out a little bit. I would like to see more acceleration here, but the trend is definitely up, okay? And it's been up, consolidate, up, consolidate, up, consolidate. So let it break out and then maybe play the next pullback or look at the GOGL, wait for it to pull back. CRCM. We're going to have to wrap it up quickly. No, I don't like the fact that I think I talked about this last week. It really didn't get past this prior peak in here. It's kind of all over the place. I think you can do better than that. John, good job. John picked out my uh, stock for the day. So, yeah, you can do better than that. You picked out the, the right one. APHQF. What the freak is that? APHQF. Never heard of it. APHQF. It's not in my system. FCEL. FCEL. 
Um, let's zoom in a little bit. Well, it's kind of scraping bottom in here. It's kind of a penny stock. I hear you though. It's probably a bow tie. It's a bow tie. Um, it looks a, it's a little thin if you look at the price of the stock based on the volume. I mean, it looks okay. It's got some bad memories along the way, but I guess if it got all the way up to there, I mean, it looks okay. Maybe maybe buy it, but use a dollar sixty nine stop. Okay. <laughs> Would solid have been the first pullback after a base breakout a few weeks ago? Good question. Um, yeah, I think so. It looked okay. Um, you know, it was one of those cases where it didn't really clear the base enough, and I wish it would have. But it looked okay, okay? I, he's asking, that, is this the first pullback after a base breakout? The answer is yes. The only caveat would be that I wish it would have gone a little bit further before it pulled back like it did. But yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, learn how to, you start recognizing these patterns, then you're well on your way. So good good job on that, John, for recognizing that. U-T, U-C-T-T, yeah. Somebody emailed me on this one. They're, they've been long forever and just following along. Good job. Um, I think I would leave this one alone. And this isn't the best example of the net-net, but now you're beginning to have a net-net issue with this stock. I got to keep preaching. I got to stop preaching about the net net because, of course, I said you don't believe me about the net net price change come to the weekly charts. I said about three times, and now you guys know better than to ask me about stock going sideways. So now I'm gonna look like an idiot. <laughs> Gbed. All right, we're gonna probably have to wrap it up after this, just because of the court recording at all. Um. Yeah. The problem is, it really. If it pulled back, it pulled back to this base. Put it on your watch list. Little, it can be thin. That's no, okay. It's a little wide and loose, but it finally it's beginning to get its act together. So maybe if it could continue higher, accelerate higher, I'll pull back. Okay. Well, look, I need to wrap things up. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much. Everyone have a, a fantastic holiday weekend. Uh, to those who celebrate, happy Easter. To those who don't, happy Sunday. It's still Sunday, right? <laughs> You're safe. We can't see you, so you can't look like an idiot. You can sound like one. Yeah, sometimes I know I do. But everybody have a great weekend, holiday weekend. If we don't see you again, uh, or we don't talk again, I should say, between now and then. And then uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll talk again next Thursday, if not sooner. So feel free to shoot me an email somewhere along the way. If I don't have time to answer it or it requires a lot of thought, I will cover it in next week's show. Okay? Thank you, guys and girls, so much.